Hello, and welcome to Homicide, Inc. I'm Peter Von Gom. In today's podcast, we have a whodunit for the ages. The victim is 25-year-old Utra, a young mother and wife. The murder suspect? A snake. Five feet of brawn and drop-dead deadly. But unlike the snake in the Garden of Eden, for example, this perp's not talking. In a country like India that records more than 80,000 deaths yearly from snake bites alone, why was this woman's death any different from the others? Something very sly and sinister was at play. Let me explain. Just a real quick favor to ask, if you haven't rated the Homicide Inc. podcast yet, please do so. It helps with the growth of the podcast tremendously. On Apple Podcasts, just scroll down to the bottom and you'll find a place to click the stars and leave a review. Thank you very much. Utra's parents were looking for someone to marry their daughter. They weren't looking for a wealthy suitor. Their needs were human. They wanted someone to care for their daughter. You see, Utra had a learning disability, and they needed someone who would love her for who she was and be there for her. Through a matchmaker, they found him, 26-year-old Suraj Kumar, a bank clerk of modest means. His father was an auto rickshaw driver, his mother a housewife. This seems like great news, right? Well, don't cheer just yet. This was a stereotypical arranged marriage in India. Families decide on who their offspring marries. Another practice is the giving of dowries by the bride's family. Utra was no exception. She came into her marriage with a dowry of 720 grams of gold, worth about $67,000, a brand new Suzuki sedan, $10,000, and 500,000 rupees in cash, about 6600 bucks. This was all held in a bank deposit box, bearing both Utra and Suraj's names. Within a year, the couple happily welcomed their son into the world. Utra and Suraj lived with his parents, as was the custom, but the picture of smiling faces hanging on the wall in their home masked a different reality. Their custom ended, and greed sank its teeth. Suraj and his family were cashing in on their cash cow daughter-in-law, making demand after demand of anything that they wanted. Household appliances, a car, furniture, renovation for their home, even admission fees for an MBA for Suraj's sister. The writing on the wall was bold. Show us the money. Utra's parents met their demands, even paying 8,000 rupees monthly for their daughter's upkeep. They hoped that by placating their in-laws with money, they could keep the demons at bay. They were wrong. Suraj's family rewarded their generosity by mistreating Utra and scorning her for being differently abled. Once, Suraj told her cousin, even if you're showered with gold, can you tolerate a disabled woman? Too bad he didn't have such standards before the marriage. Yet, the list of demands kept piling up. Next, he wanted a scooter for his sister and a new house. Utra's family pushed back. No, they would not be buying his sister a scooter, and they would build a house for the couple only if Suraj agreed to live closer to them. Suraj refused. <laughs> a beggar with choice. Soon, the family decided to put an end to the harassment of their daughter. They wanted a divorce and demanded all of her dowries returned. Suraj immediately relented. There will be no more problems, he said. What the family did not know was Suraj was planning to rid himself of Utra permanently. In the early hours of May 7, 2020, Utra's mother heard the slap of feet on the stairs. No one was ever awake at this time. Maybe it was her daughter, Utra, walking on her own for the first time in months. She had been recovering at home after a lengthy stay in the hospital. More on that later. When she entered the bedroom, her smile 
took a downward turn as her son-in-law came into view. She wasn't a fan, and he never woke up this early. Ever. They exchanged greetings, and she watched him go to the veranda, holding a newspaper. Utra's mother couldn't shake off the veil of distrust that she had for Suraj. She still had suspicions that he was involved in her daughter's hospitalization. Later that morning, when she called for Utra upstairs and got no reply, she went up to her room and found her unconscious. Her mouth was agape and her left hand dangling to the side. Her scream tore through the walls of the house. Utra was pronounced dead at the hospital from a snake bite. Her brother searched the room and found the culprit, a spectacled cobra, one of the most venomous snakes in the world. He killed it. Yes, the murderer was dead, but so was his sister. With snake bites being very common in India, the police had no reasons to suspect foul play. It was just another tragedy, everyone thought. Everyone except Utra's mother. Don't play on a mother's intuition. The neighbors had their own suspicions. Two words, Sarpa Dosha, a superstitious belief that cobras could curse families that didn't worship them. It explained why Utra had been bitten twice by snakes in as many months. The snakes had been haunting her. Why, in 15 years, there had been no snake bites in the area. Their gossip landed on the ears of a snake expert who was visiting the area. His curiosity was stirred, and he decided to visit Utra's parents' home and see for himself. As his shoes crunched the gravel on the walkway up to the house, clouds of suspicion began to form. Snakes didn't like gravel. It was not easy for them to wriggle on. Inside the house, he climbed up the stairs and into the room Utra had lost her life. He noticed an air conditioner and was informed that it had been on that terrible night. He mentally ticked off another discrepancy. Cobras are largely dormant after 8 p.m. The added cold from the air conditioner should have made the snake curl up and sleep. The last thing it would have done was attack someone. Imagining the snake had leapt over the gravel, it still didn't answer the $64,000 question. How had the snake gotten into the room at all? With the air conditioner on, the windows had been closed, and the room's walls had no openings or cracks anywhere. When the snake expert heard that just two months before, Utra had fallen victim to another snake attack, his spidey senses started to tingle. He decided to visit the scene of that crime as well, Suraj's parents' home. It turned out to be another unlikely scene. It was a three-story house on a marshy land, not at all like the dry, arid landscape Russell's vipers tend to favor. Within, he noted the smooth, tiled floors. That alone would have discouraged the viper's progression. If not that, then slithering up two floors would have done the trick. Maybe that viper had legs. The snake expert knew what suspicion smelt like, and he told the family of his findings. Utra's father's eyes narrowed in suspicion as the one suspect leapfrogged to his mind. It was the very same person he had started to scuffle with over the assets Utra had left behind, his grieving son-in-law, Suraj. He notified the police. They immediately began investigations, and it was soon revealed that Suraj's macabre plan to end the life of his wife and mother to his son had started to take shape the year before, when her family had demanded better treatment for their daughter. His Google searches contained six months of history on how to handle snakes. When he was ready, he befriended a snake catcher one who deals illegally in the trade of snakes, and bought a Russell's Viper from him. His first attempt was a dismal failure that mocked his months of preparation. He had left the snake on the staircase, then, pretending he left his phone in the bedroom upstairs, he asked Utra to help him get it. 
Ever the dutiful wife, she had obeyed, but shouted in alarm when she saw the writhing movements of the snake. Suraj removed his accomplice. My hero, Utra must have thought. Two days later, Suraj and his accomplice made a second attempt. This time, he mixed sedatives with the porridge she ate that night. When she was asleep, he held the snake to bite her leg. Utra woke to the excruciating pain and screamed for help. Suraj tried to make her go back to sleep, accusing her of being delusional. Eventually, maybe fearing the neighbors might hear, took her to the hospital. What a gent. As Utra was admitted to the hospital and seemed to be recovering, Suraj decided to up the ante. The viper was a failure. He needed something stronger to end his wife's life once and for all. Some days, he sat at her bedside in the hospital while reading and watching videos on cobras. Fifty-two days later, after undergoing intensive treatment and plastic surgery to repair the damage, Utra was discharged from the hospital. She chose to go to her parents' home to recover. Two days later, under the guise of visiting his still-bedridden wife, Suraj showed up with his new little friend, a five-foot cobra. You know the type that you see in movies with the snake charmers blowing their flutes and their heads all fanned out and they're ready to pounce? Yeah, one of those types. He bought it a week before and had starved it. At night, while good folk lay sleeping, the evil of Suraj came out to play. He mixed a heavier dose of sleeping tablets with some juice to knock her out, not because he didn't want her to feel the pain, but to keep her from crying out like she had done the last time. When he was certain she was dead to the world, he took the cobra out of the bottle and threw it at her. The cobra didn't bite. Suraj then picked it up and squeezed its head, forcing the snake to bite her arm. He then released the snake, who crawled behind a cupboard in the room. Mission complete. Suraj washed the glass tumbler he used to drug Utra, deleted his call history of all calls with the snake handler, deleted his search history, so he thought, and destroyed the stick he had used to handle the snake. He then stayed awake throughout the night to make sure he didn't fall victim to his own snake. Come morning, he left the room. Behind him, his unconscious wife, his one-year-old child, and that deadly, starved cobra. With all the mounting evidence, Suraj was arrested. Further investigation also revealed that on the day she was first bitten by the viper, Suraj had relieved the bank deposit box of a large portion of Utra's dowry. Gold would eventually be found buried on Suraj's family property. He was also arrested on charges of destroying evidence and theft. A month later, his father and sister were arrested as well on charges of conspiracy, domestic violence, and destruction of evidence. No honor among thieves, I guess. The motive behind it all? Simple. Greed. Suraj didn't want to be married to Utra anymore, but he saw himself married to her dowry. If she divorced him, he would lose that. If she died from a weapon, he would lose it. But were she to die by an accident, or something that looked like an accident, say, I don't know, a bite by a highly venomous snake, he would be left swimming in new money as one of India's most eligible newly minted widowers. The insurance he had placed on her life was an added incentive. Suraj was found guilty of exoricide, the killing of one's wife. This was a first-of-its-kind case in India, murder by the use of a venomous cobra. Though he didn't get a death sentence as a first-time offender, and because he was young, he faces 17 years for poisoning and destroying evidence. And this will be followed by two life sentences. If the sentence holds up, he will most certainly die in prison. A huge portion of Utra's dowry remains missing. The couple's two-year-old son, who was named by his paternal parents, 
has had this name and all traces of Suraj's family completely removed. He now lives with his maternal grandparents, surrounded by love and pictures of his loving mother. His eyes light up when he sees them, and he says, Utraama, Utraama, the Malayalam word for mother. Well, thank you very much for joining us here on Homicide, Inc. And as always, thank you for tuning in. Man, it seems like criminals are always going to come up with new and improved methods for killing. I always wondered why criminals, would-be murderers, don't make, for example, a club out of ice. Use it as a lethal weapon on your victim, and it just becomes water. Can you trace fingerprints in a puddle of water? I don't think so. I know what you're thinking, but I didn't give you that idea. What's more, I learned a new word in this podcast, exoricide. Did anybody know what that meant? I had to look it up, and I also looked up the murder of one's husband. It's called meriticide. There you have it. Who says you don't learn something on the Homicide Inc. podcast? Well, thank you very much, as always, for joining me here on Homicide Inc. I'd like to invite you to rate this podcast, whether it's on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever you're listening from. Be a pal and click the stars and leave a comment if you would. This helps us tremendously in getting our podcast into more ears. Thank you very much. Also, make sure you subscribe so you'll get notifications as soon as a new episode is released. And be sure to check out our Patreon campaign for exclusive Homicide Inc. podcasts that are available first to patrons. That information is in the description of this podcast. If you have a compelling true crime story you'd like me to consider investigating, please send me an email. And if you'd like to help support the production of the Homicide Inc. podcast, you can always buy us a cup of coffee. Those details are also in the description and on the Homicide Inc. website where you can hear all the podcasts and see some other cool stuff. Thanks so much, and we'll see you again very soon. Ciao for now.